Hey, what's going on everybody? In this lesson, we're going to be talking about replication and sharding for databases. So how we go from a single database instance to multiple instances, but everything working together as a single unit, or you might hear the term cluster. So a cluster is when you have multiple database instances. So this is going to use technology such as replication and sharding. This is going to probably be the last video before we start talking about no SQL databases and the different types and how they work. I'm really excited for that video. This is going to lay the foundation just to make sure we got everything covered before we go into that content. I also want to show off my wife's beautiful new sweater. Shh. That's Relax, okay? So when I explain the majority of these concepts, Let's first apply this to relational databases. So traditional databases, think Oracle, MySQL, Postgres. Many of the NoSQL databases are more friendlier when it comes to splitting data up across multiple nodes. So let's first think from a relational database point of view. Now we've talked about some of these principles in the earlier videos in this series, but you don't necessarily have to go watch those if you're just jumping in here. Basically we have a computer, it's running the database software. This is our database instance and we first want to vertically scale our database instance. So that means increasing the compute power of just this single server. Generally, if we get to the point where we're working with multiple instances, we don't wanna be doing this with commodity hardware for traditional database systems. What I mean by that is you don't wanna be working with a bunch of average servers. You want to be working with a really powerful server before you worry about splitting it up across multiple. And this is adequate for many use cases. If you want to do additional research, you can look up sites or apps that have been very successful using just a single database instance. And often before we have to worry about using multiple instances, there are other things we can do to make things more efficient so that we're not putting as much pressure on that database server. So an example of this would be caching. We could cache data in something like Redis, which can reduce the amount of requests we have to make to the database. So here are two things that we can do. We can reduce the database load with things like I just mentioned, Redis, caching, and we can increase the single instance compute power. So vertically scale the database instance. So let's take a moment to talk about NoSQL and how we can actually help with this problem. NoSQL is a category of databases, so this doesn't describe a single database instance or a bunch of databases that all work exactly the same way. And what that means is there's often a bunch of specialized databases that might help with specific things. And this specialization means we might use a NoSQL database for a certain part of our application or backend, but not necessarily for just everything like we might use a relational database for. Sometimes that's the case. There might be a NoSQL database that you decide, hey, this is going to be my main database for my data storage. But often it's the case, you'll have a main relational database, but you might use NoSQL databases for some specific use cases, and it's not going to store all of the data for everything. So we've already talked about one of these, which is Redis or some kind of in-memory cache, this could be classified as a NoSQL database. So Redis could be used for any type of data that doesn't need to be preserved forever. Another example is Elasticsearch. This is a database that is specialized in searching. Shocker, right? But there might be a scenario where you might be doing a lot of this searching and you don't want to have to throw that load on your main database. So you can put the data that you need to work with into Elasticsearch and then just use that database for that purpose. There are also client side databases. So this would be indexed DB. So this is specifically referring to the web browser. It has indexed DB available for data storage that doesn't need to be stored on the server. So this might be something that, you know, is used actively, but again, doesn't need to be stored forever. So maybe it's some kind of local game or some settings or something that don't require permanent storage, but you want to store that information somewhere. And one option for doing that would be to use a local database such as IndexedDB. So those are just three examples where putting some of the data in other locations might actually help to reduce the total required computation of the main relational database system. You can also use a data warehouse. So if you're doing a bunch of analytics 
and this is going to be computationally expensive, it might make sense to actually bring the data from a relational standard database for transactional processing to a data warehouse. And this data warehouse is more efficient for analytics. So that will mean the main database is reserved for really just transactional processing, which you will also hear as OLTP, which is short for online transactional processing, or for data warehousing, you might hear OLAP for analytical processing. I guess I'll just write it over here. However, my big head might get in the way. So we have transactional, analytical. So that's a variety of different ways you can reduce the demand of a single database instance. Now, if this kind of stuff interests you and you want to know more, that's what we're going to be talking about probably in the next lesson. So stay tuned for that. So we've gone through efforts to reduce the load on this database and it's finally good to go. Maybe there might actually be some other things that we want to do to make sure that our database layer is good to go completely. So now let's talk about how we can continue to improve our database layer. We've already done what we could to reduce the demand on the database, and we've made an effort to vertically scale the single database instance before having to worry about multiple database servers. So what other concerns might we have? Well, the first thing I want to mention does not actually reduce the total load on the database, but it does help with data durability and high availability, which is to have a failover. So we want to remove the single point of failure, which is having a single instance. That's probably my first biggest concern here is if we have a single instance and, you know, I don't know, it explodes in a big fiery ball of fire, even if we were able to recover this data, the database instance might be offline longer than we would like. So we'll first worry about high availability, and then we're going to talk about some of the options to actually reduce computational load by introducing more servers. If we go back in time before our database exploded, we can now have a stand-in node, and this is a database instance that's basically a copy of the current instance and the data is going to be replicated from one node to the other. So this is where we introduce the idea of replication. So with replication, you can just think of data being copied over to another server. This database is ready to go. So if our main database did explode into a fiery ball of fire, we would then be able to direct traffic to this other database without having any interruption in the user experience. So we removed the single point of failure. We're good to go. So let's look at replication a little bit closer and we'll ask ourselves, how does the second database get the data? Now, obviously the answer is replication, but let's talk a little bit in more detail. And technically, if you want to do some research, you can look up the write ahead log, which will get you started in this area. So WAL. So that's basically a log that all things that happen to the database goes to that log. And that can then be used to replicate the same information to another instance. But practically we write each incoming write to both databases. And this is important to think about and understand. There are two, there's a microphone right here, which is why I'm always like looking here. So if I'm always just like staring off in the distance, I just for some reason think that's like a camera or something. I don't know. I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Now this writing to both instances is done automatically for us. So it's not like we actually have to write the query twice or something like that. But the main thing to understand is that there are two writes in this process. So we're not actually reducing the demand. We're doubling the writes and we're doubling the number of instances that we write to. So yes, we double the compute having two instances but we're now doing twice as many writes. And that's the reason why it doesn't even help us if we were to make both of these writable. If you could write to either of these, you might think, hey, that could double our computation power, right? Basically horizontally scaling our database. But if the data is synced across both of these, then we're doing just double the amount of writes. So it doesn't matter that we now have two servers, we're just making it more complicated. So imagine each one of these, I'm just making these numbers up, but let's say we could do a thousand transactions per second. And then let's say we wanted to somehow make these both writable. We might now be able to process 2000 transactions per second, but a single write now becomes two writes. 
So then this number is really just cut back down in half to a thousand. Long story short, replication does not help with IO if it's a one-to-one -one replication. And we'll talk about this more, but the concept of replication will be used even if it's not a direct copy. So when we get into sharding, there still might be some replication. It just might not be a complete duplicate on every single computer. Let's say this was your database server and you want to add more nodes, but not just for the sake of having stand-in nodes, but you actually want to be able to write to multiple nodes, a multi-master database cluster, or you might hear it as active active. So now let's say instead of just a single node, we have three nodes and we write to one of these nodes. There might be replication from one node to the next node. So that introduces redundancy. It improves the durability. Oh, I just bought a heart attack. Claire, seriously? <laughs> so this increases the durability of our data because we now have redundancy. If one of these catches on fire, we still have a backup. But we don't necessarily have to replicate it to all of the nodes. So let's say maybe we write to this node and it's replicated to this node. And then we write to this node and it's replicated to this node. So for every write, it's written to two nodes, but we have three nodes of compute. In this situation, we can process in total more transactions because we don't replicate the transaction to all of the nodes. We only replicate it to some of the nodes. So this is the logical next step to database clustering. However, it does introduce a variety of challenges. So if you're just working with traditional relational databases, it is possible to do something like this. And there's often different companies or services that will do this kind of thing for you. So you can have multi-master replication and have a database cluster where you can write to multiple nodes. It helps with a variety of things. First, it helps with redundancy of data so you don't lose anything. It helps with total compute power so you can increase the total write capacity. And it could potentially help with latency because you can space out data appropriately where data is being requested. So I'm definitely not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's a new layer of complexity and really you usually don't wanna to go to this unless you're like an enterprise level software where this is needed. Now, when it comes to NoSQL databases, there are some that were designed with this problem in mind. So if you're going to go the route of having multiple nodes, it might be worth considering a NoSQL database but there are challenges with that as well. You have to think about how you're actually going to structure the data as it's usually a little bit different than a relational database. So if you're brand new, it might take a little bit of learning on how to properly structure that database so that data is located in the right location and data that needs to be accessed together can be accessed together. And then there's all kinds of different configurations like the replication factor, how many times you wanna replicate data. There's also other quorum settings that you'll need to consider so that you're writing and reading to the proper number of nodes for your use case. We'll get into that. Don't you guys worry, I got your back. New videos coming soon, so be sure to subscribe. And if you do enjoy this type of material and you want to get better, break into software engineering or advance your software engineering career, I do work with people directly in my mentorship program. So if that's something of interest to you, I'll have a link down in the description. Check it out and hopefully we'll get to work together. Now let's go back to just relational databases. Before you go the clustering route, there's some simple things you can do with replication that will make things better. So say this is our database. We can first, like I mentioned, add in a stand-in node. Oh my gosh, that was awful. If anything goes wrong with this guy, you got a second one ready to go. So that's basically a backup for computation a running database. You can also back up your data, which doesn't actually keep a database instance running ready to go. It's really just the actual content, the files. So if you're a really high tech company and you want to do some cutting edge stuff, then yeah, back up your data. Additionally, you can make replicas that are for reading. This will offer a few benefits. It will allow us to individually scale the reads and writes if we're directing reading to a separate instance, basically the data will just be replicated from the writes to the read database. And then we can adjust the compute power either up or down for these individual instances. So we just really have to worry about being able to write fast enough on this node. And then we can adjust this node as needed to meet the reading requirements. Same idea here. So now we can actually horizontally scale 
the reading capacity thanks to replication from the main write node. So you can vertically scale an individual node or you can add more read replicas. A benefit of adding more of them is that you can spread them out in different areas. So, hey, maybe this one's in the US, maybe this one's in Europe. So if you have a, a user and they're reading data from the website, well, that's going to be a lot faster than reading the data all the way from over here. You could also have stand-in nodes for these guys as well if you needed. So if for some reason you want to make sure that this node does not go down, even though it's just for reading, you can still have a stand-in node to fill in if something were to go wrong. This is less important than this guy here because if you didn't have the stand-in node and this exploded, well, you could just direct to a different read node and your application is still going to work. Now, when you have this setup where you're writing to one main node and it's replicating down to read nodes, this is usually eventually consistent. And what this means is that the data on this node is going to match this data exactly. It's just going to be a little bit delayed. So say you write a blog post and it goes to this node. It's then replicated down to this node, but you're very fast, right? You write that blog post and you immediately check to see if that blog post is there. Maybe your read is routed to this node and it says, oh no, there's no blog post there. You would say that that's inconsistent. The data doesn't match but it's eventually consistent. So if you just wait long enough, eventually that blog post is going to appear when you read and everything's fine. That's okay in the majority of cases. So social medias, blogging websites, most apps, the eventual consistency is fine. However, there may be scenarios where that's not okay and you need to make sure that your replication is consistent, which in that situation, it would actually write to the read node and confirm that before the write is confirmed on the main node. So that's going to slow things down, but we'll make sure that all of the nodes have the same data. This might be an option you can configure depending on the database you use or the hosting provider you use. It might be the case that if you just want to do very simple replication automatic based on your cloud provider, that they don't give you a ton of configuration options. But you can do some research on your needs, the different databases and different providers. It's going to change if you're using cloud databases or if you're hosting these yourself, but I'm just giving you an overview of the different approaches and concepts. There's eventual consistency and then there's just consistent. And if you wanna know more about these different concerns, check out my previous video on the CAP theorem. That's going to go in a lot more depth. Now, another question you might have is if you have multiple read nodes, how is the data distributed? There are database load balancers, but it's often the case that this load balancing is not done just out of the box for you. So you can do different things like weighted DNS routing or using multiple connection strings. So two reading connection strings and round robin them in your code. Or you can look into some of the load balancers. So HA proxy, if you want to learn more about that or use a hosting service that does this kind of thing for you. So for example, Amazon Aurora Postgres compatible is going to be able to do that kind of load balancing for the reading all built in. So there are options out there to do that kind of thing. You'll just need to do some additional research. Now, in the case of Aurora, well, if that's something you want to know a lot of more information about, go look up dedicated content for that. But that's something that can be provisioned saying, hey, here's the server size that I want. Or it could be serverless where it's basically just paid on a per use basis. So those are two different options and you can do research on that as well. Well, guys, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover in this video. Well, actually, I had a bunch of other notes, but I'm like, ah, I'm kind of getting bored. So we'll end it there. Now, when it comes to sharding, which we didn't talk about in tons of detail, this is really just splitting up data across multiple nodes where it's not exactly one-to-one -one replication. This is going to come up a lot more with NoSQL databases, which we'll talk about in more detail in the upcoming lessons. Basically with sharding, we need to figure out how we split up data, writing to some nodes, not writing to some nodes, and all of those different configuration options. So we'll get into some of that in more detail as we go. If you enjoy my content, please be sure to subscribe. I'll also have a link to the backend mind map, which will be great if you want to know more about backend technologies. And I'll have a link to my mentorship program if you want to really level up your software engineering game and work with me closely. So check that out as well, and I'll see you in the next one.